Greetings, Grapple fans. For 30 years, wrestling was part of our stable diet on television. It was both gripping and grunting, powerful yet pantomime, energetic and full of an eclectic mix of characters that made this sport compulsive viewing. It started as macho entertainment in the music halls in the early 20th century and ended up being a favorite to the Raw family, commanding nationwide appeal. Wrestling came to our TV screens back in 1955 and was top-rating entertainment for over 30 years. At its pomp in the 60s, there would be over 4,000 featured bills a year, but it was showcased by the ITV World of Sport program every Saturday evening. It regularly attracted over 8 million viewers, but it disappeared from our TV screens during the late 90s. Joining me are three men synonymous with wrestling. Factory first had to pester joint promotions to get his first break in wrestling. Factory worker turned wrestler Tony Banger fought Big Daddy more than any other opponent would. And he was often the tag partner of both Giant Haystack and Mal Kirk. Banger Walsh also spent much time in the ring with my next guest, son of the famous Manchester Heavyweight Jim Hussey, rollerball Mark Rocco turned pro in 1970 and quickly became one of the slickest movers in the heavy middleweight division. This success, by the way, curtailed a possible career in show jumping. <clears throat> well, he became a British and world middle heavyweight champion and was soon distinguished by his leotards and his Tom Selleck. This story, though, would never be told without the contribution of my next guest, the most featured wrestler of all time in television bouts, Mick McManus, crafted a ring persona effective in arousing fans' hatred over several decades. A man who was just as comfortable in the company, by the way, of the good and the great, mixing with royalty, the Beatles, and other entertainment celebrities. He was simply master of the ring. Mick, let's start with you and ask you, why was wrestling so popular in those days? What was its appeal? I think it was completely different. There was nothing ever like that on, uh, on, on, on TV. And um, it, um, it had lots of movement, lots of action. It was pretty spectacular at times with the drop kicks and the flying tackles and that sort of thing. And I think it appealed to all sorts of people, uh, young, middle age, old age, uh, workers, middle class, upper class, it appealed to everybody. And uh, I think the, uh, the fact was that um, eight million people can't be, all could, couldn't be wrong, could they, every Saturday? Were you surprised at how it took off? I think everybody was, including the television companies. I think they were quite surprised at the reaction they got. And don't forget, really, people, wrestlers became sort of uh, household names. Fellas like Big Daddy, Haystacks, and the Rollerball, Mark Rocco, and, and uh, Huzzy, and uh, all, all that crowd, you know, they were, everybody knew them but just as well as they knew anyone else, really. Mark, your <clears throat> dad, gentleman. Jumping Jim. Jim. Hussey, Jumping yeah. Jim. Yeah. Um, you obviously grew up with wrestling. I grew up in a wrestling family because my dad was, from, my dad was wrestling when I was born. So I grew up in that system. And, um, I travelled a lot with him, you know, early days. Uh, I used to fly to, I remember when I was 12, he used to fly to Paris, where he used to go and do two or three bouts, at least in my mart, Cirque de Vier, Palais de Sport, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we were back for Sunday night, you know. I used to go with him on the plane, and I was quite excited about all that. I used to follow my dad around, and I used to be in the dressing room atmosphere, everybody knew me, but I never intended to be a wrestler. The last thing my dad wanted to be was a wrestler. It was very hard, and the pay wasn't wonderful at the time, and, um, you know, a lot of injuries and things like that. And my dad didn't want me to do it. He wanted to be a show jumper. And I rode from being about 12 years old, uh, 10 or 12. My mother had a riding stables early days. And I rode, my sister rode as well. And I became quite good at what I did and um, rode for England on uh, two or three years for the English team, on the Young Riders team and all that. I won the National uh, Young Riders Championship. And um, I, I, in the, in, behind my father's back, um, he had a little gymnasium on the farm, which is a big building with a ring in it, literally, and white weights. And all the Manchester boys used to go there and train because he didn't charge them anything. He had to pay to go in the gyms, and he used to let them do it for free. Johnson, who is like a big brother to me, was wrestling, a uh, young wrestler. 
and he took me under his, his wing and showed me some of the moves I with. And my dad didn't know this, and my mum didn't tell him. I used to go there. After. I suppose I should have been riding, but I was in the gym. And I loved it. I got so sort of, um, involved with it. But I've got to give a little credit to Mick here, because I was a teenager, and I was all of you with my dad. And my dad had been on. I think my dad was top of the bill or, or whatever. Um, no, he wouldn't have been, because he was on with Palo. And he would, he, my dad was on the bill early, early on. And, I, and he said, come on, we'll go. And I said, no, I want to watch this match. And I stood in the chute. The chute is where you come from the dressing room to the ring. And I stood there, a little lad, you know, watching them wrestling. I'd watched it a hundred times. And they had a match. Him and Jackie Palo. Mick McManus and Jackie Palo. And the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. The crowd reaction was amazing. And Bellevue was a wooden stadium. It was wooden floors. And the people were stamping their feet. And the sound crescendoed. It was amazing. And at 12 years old or 13 years old, I walked away and I had the glimmer. It put a spark in my little mind that I loved that business. And although my dad pushed me for, rest, uh, for the jumping and all the rest of it, show jumping, I was doing that as well. But in the background behind his back, I wrestled in the spare time in Midas gym. But he was the guy, his match with Palo was magic. And all through the years, there's been no series of matches with different people that have created audiences and inspired people. Now, Tony, you were watching all this on television as well. So, so how did you get involved? What did it do to you? Well, I come a different route because um, I was working on the door. I was about 18, uh, at a big nightclub you know, where I live in the Midlands. And one of the guys that worked with me was a guy called Barry Hawkins, who was a professional wrestler. He went as Klondike Jake. <coughs> and uh, I was boxing amateur at the time for Leamington Boys Club, the same club that produced Randolph Turpin. And... Um, he said to me, I've got a show on at Starport at 7 next week. He says, and uh, I think you'll be all right having a go at this wrestling bank. So I said, OK, fine. Um, so I went along, and they shoved me in without telling me anything about the business. And it was like a real fight. And I was on with a guy called Mike Pritchard, or Kurt Stein, he used to use the name. Very old star wrestler, probably worked with Mark Stad. Um, and I just took, I wanted to do this wrestling. It just is like that. It's a disease. If you get a wrestling injury, it's a disease. You can't kick it. It's, it's very hard. Um, so I started wrestling on the independent circuit uh, and also working on the fun fairs on the booth because I could box and I could wrestle a little bit then. So I'd take on geezers and box them and then I'd take them on and wrestle them. Um, but Barry always said to me, George Jake, he said, to do any good in wrestling, you've got to get on the telly. You've got to be up there with McManuses and Logans and Kellets and... So I bombarded George Solutions, um, which was George Rell Wisco's company up north. Then there was Dale Martins, which Mick would run the office at one time. Um, Marilyn Beresford. It was like a cartel that run the TV wrestling. And if you wasn't in that cartel, you wasn't going on television, and you wasn't working very often. So you had to break the stranglehold. And I, I just bombarded them and bombarded them. And I'd go to all the shows at the Leamington in the old pavilion before the spa centre was built and just badger them, and eventually, they, uh, St Paul's gym in Leeds. And I used to go up every weekend and train with people like Dennis Mitchell and Alan Dennis and, and some fantastic all-star yeah, wrestlers. Great, great, yeah. And they could all do the job for real, you know, a lot of them were very, very good wrestlers. Uh, sometimes on the train back to Leamington Spa and I'd be in agony. They'd body slap me all over, <laughs> and there was no suspension on the floors, it was like a floor. Um, but it didn't deter me. And I stuck at it, and eventually I got a job from Dale's office then. And he just said to me, get your gear and go down to Western Supermare. And I went down there, and it was like a kid walking into a lad in the was, I think on the bill was like Massambula. I think Mark might have been on. Um, Kellett was on, I think. And you walk in, and it was just like being with the people you, you look up to in the business. You know? how, how was all this managed? You know, how was it all organised, Mick, in those days? It's a huge well, operation. Their uh, office was I a think huge the, operation. Um, no, I think the uh, promoters obviously all got together and they formed a company called Joint Promotions. Uh, this obviously was a good idea because, A, you never tread on anyone's toes, you never run shows in the same halls as the others, you shared the, uh, the, the, the good wrestlers That's amongst, the, amongst, you know, equally. And uh, so no one had the monopoly sort of thing. Otherwise, if there, someone had the monopoly, you'd only have about two promoters running the whole business. 
So I think this was, this was a very fair way of uh, running wrestling. And of course wrestling was so big that you needed a big organisation to run it. The amount of shows that used to be run every week, every year, was, it was staggering. Well, the wrestlers looked after. Did they get paid okay or paid badly or, or Yeah, what? they got... Uh, it varied, really, according it's like everything else, really, according to uh, how good you were and that sort of thing. They never got overwhelmed with money. It's not like footballers earning under £1,000 a week, you know. But um, a lot of them got a pretty good living out, uh, out of the business, uh, and others who weren't so, perhaps so good never did and probably had to take the made wrestling not sort of a part-time occupation. Real good bouts were, were Jackie Palo against Mick McManus and they drew millions on television. Um, you were the man they loved to hate. How did all that work between you and Palo? I think it, I think it was a natural sort of a natural progression I think over the uh, over the sort of uh, uh, years because um, you know, Palo came from the north of London, I came from the south and uh, it's like in the old days you know north, north and sort of enemies but they had nothing in common sort of thing so that was the first geographical difference between us and then the as he made a name for himself and I made a name for myself uh, if I hadn't have been around he'd have been a big shot if he hadn't have been around I'd have been a big shot so there was that sort of amount of um, uh, needle b between us really but um, uh, we had some terrific matches and uh, created a great deal of interest no to, to wind that. you up once he, he jumped out the ring and kissed your wife. How did you take that? I, I don't think so. I doubt very much because my wife very rarely went to wrestling. She, yeah. she wasn't. A, she, she was a wrestling fan, obviously, but um, she didn't go to so many. Uh, that happened in '67. No, I, I can't remember. It. You say it's right. It must yeah. be right. But, um, <laughs> but the sort of thing he would do, you know, he did. He do that, yeah. He yeah, he wouldn't. Uh, he he wouldn't think twice about whether it offended anybody or not. You know. He's very brave. Uh, Palo, wasn't he? He used to walk in the dressing room with a big guy there, you know, a big American guy or an import or whatever, or Bruno or somebody, he'd walk in and he'd be dead cheeky to him, pull the pants down or something, you know what I mean? Or, you know, he was really, he was a cheeky guy, and how he didn't, he, he was inst he was a very annoying type of person, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he was. knows better um, than anybody, very annoying type of person. Well, we got him back a few times. Yeah. I remember the issue. we used to spray his boots, do you remember? Yeah, Mick, you yeah, spray his yeah. boots silver or gold. <laughs> <laughs> and they switched it for the aerosol, for the under the yeah, arm, and he did it under the arm with the paint. He made a big name for himself, Jack, and uh, and of course he knew it, you know, and, yeah, he, was, yeah. he, he, and he really worked on that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, he yeah. knew he was a big shot and he made sure it, it, everyone else knew he and was he brought his shot. boy into the business, didn't he? Yeah. Right? The thing, he brought the thing his lad is, into the business. Yeah. The, the thing is, people came to see um, a particular thing, and it was, it was Mick and Jackie Palo that were very popular at the time, and all through the years, there's always been a big main event, and the big main event is, was very... Uh, Ken Walt was very influential in um, making people like or dislike somebody, or believing in, them, in their ability. Kent was very influential in that. I remember joint promotions, I don't know if you were still there, but they brought a great big black guy from Africa, and he had, um, he had war paint on, white war paint, and he had a big skull and crossbones on his chest. You remember his he, name, and he, he walked... Big Jim Harris. Big Jim Harris, his real name was uh, he, Jim he, Harris, he, he wrestled. He became a major star with the WWF. He did, but when he came Kamala. to England, right, he was, a, you'll remember, the big black guy. Yeah, he, he brought bones, he had real yeah. bones he came in the ring with him. And, and the kids were crying and running away, and everyone was frightened of him. And I remember with, uh, was sitting with Crabtree and with Kent Walton, and Crabtree and me were saying to him, this guy's great, you know, I'd seen him before. You've got to really give him a the crowd believe him and really, uh, you know, and Kent watched him go in the ring and he's walking around, he's doing all the hoo-ha voodoo stuff and all the crowd are look like, whoa, you know, all this business and they're frightened to death of me and he got out of the ring and he ran in the crowd, they all scattered and everything, you know, and Kent Walton starts his, 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 his chat and he said, well, you know, Jim Harris, his real name, Jim Harris, he had that American <laughs> accent, you know, and Jim Harris is a really nice guy, he met his wife before, she's lovely, her name's <laughs> Linda, you know, and he breeds budgies, you know, he has, he's a, he's a, he's a, a fan of breeding budgies, and he's such a gentleman, he comes over here, as a, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm watching the playback, I'm thinking, what is he doing, what's he saying, he's killing him, so, and he did, he killed him, you know, now you could get, you could get somebody else, you know, uh, you get, little Jimmy Brakes would get on the ring, but Jimmy Brakes is a great performer, fantastic, 
and 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 Jimmy was a nice guy and a funny guy, you know. And by the time Kent had finished speaking about him, he was the devil. He just hadn't grown the horns yet, and that made him very popular as a villain, you know, as a, as a, as a heel. And he had that influence on the crowd, on the viewing public. He could change the opinion of it, of anything. But in saying that, we've had some really dodgy characters come from over the water. But all when Daddy was on with a guy called the American Dream. Oh, he stayed Chris with Chris Cole. Same night, yeah. So. And he turns up at the Albert Hall, and he's got Joe Cocker in tow with him, the singer. I was there. I took him on my car. <laughs> and uh, he's on with Big Daddy, and uh, it got out of hand, and he refused, and he got on the plane and went home. <laughs> he went back the next day. <laughs> we, we ought to explain that Kent Walton was the ITV commentator, yes, the only yeah, wrestling yeah. commentator. He was actually born in, in Cairo, and he, he right. was in the RAF, and that's where he got his uh, mixing with Canadians. He got that transatlantic yeah, accent. But yeah. how key was he to wrestling, Kent Walton? I think he was very good for wrestling. You know, I can't say a bad word against Kent. I think he uh, he, he he looked after wrestling in that sense. Absolutely. He he, um, he, he he made sure like that everybody knew how good it was, and uh, his, 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 his his appearance, everything about Kent was was good and he uh, sort of I don't know he's anyone who, who had anything to bad to say about wrestling straight away like he'd uh, he'd turn around and uh, next thing they know they'd be the biggest fan in the world you know he had that ability he was very good for wrestling he was wrestling he was Mr. He was wrestling, Mr. wrestling. Yeah. you know he told the storyline that what we portrayed on the TV is uh, soap opera with blood sweat and tears do you know what I mean we, we're telling the story all the the, the stories worked People had a vengeance with somebody. We had he had Heroes Big Daddy. I had Marty Jones and Nagasaki and a few other people as well. And when we did that, we filled the halls. When people saw us on the TV and we had a great match, they f we filled the halls. And part of that great match was partly due to Kent Walton telling the people about the history of how it happened, how this feud came about, what, why it was uh, such a such a uh, an aggressive situation because of the things that had happened. And he told the story. Goodies against baddies was the big thing. Hmm. Who was? You, they didn't like you sometimes, the crowd. But who was the who was the biggest baddie? I'd say Mick. Mick was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Early days, Mick was the biggest. He was the man they loved to hate. You, know, yeah, like, the you, you can yeah. say this about Mick. You can say he was the most ha hated man, apart from Hitler, at one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did that come it's about? It's true. That's how did that come about? About? I don't know. I don't want to say that. Isn't that natural, natural progression? I think it was one of those things where. My particular style of wrestling, which I, I, I never changed over the years and years and years. I think I was, was always had, always had a load of energy when I was when I was young, and I sort of transferred that into the wrestling business. You know, I used to take perhaps a bit of unfair advantage here and there, and that sort of thing. And everybody, uh, they didn't accept it, they didn't like it, but they had to accept it really because. That's what I did. That's what you did. You didn't like it when they grabbed your ears. You say, me ears, me ears. What well, was that I, about? I, actually, to tell you the honest truth, really, I wasn't too bothered about the ears at all. Uh, it was more or less uh, so, was covering up for something else, like which might be a bit bad, like, and because a lot of fellas wore knee bandages. Mm. I said, what are you got a knee bandage for? I thought your knee was. He said, no, my knee's okay. It's the elbow's bad. <laughs> so therefore, if you've got, got a bandage on the knee. They work on the knee, and there's nothing wrong with the knee. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the sort of situations that used to happen, um, what happened with the crowd? Oh. oh, the crowd used to get quite incensed at times, you know, you, uh, especially if you got near the edge of, well, Mark, I know this, uh, if you got the edge of the ring leg, you know, some old dear might take a shoe off and give you a whack with a shoe, which well, wasn't very I've seen him obviously. battered with people. On and, a couple uh, of occasions, I had to get the police to get me out of the ring and get me back to the dressing room. You know, so the crowd got, really got involved, there's no question about that. But um, most of the time, the stewards were, 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 were pretty good because if there was too much disturbance, the promoters, you know, would have the shows cancelled. The police were no more wrestling here. So they had to make sure they kept it pretty, you know, pretty strict in that sense. So they couldn't get away with too much. I remember on one occasion, though, Someone, some lady, I think she must have been out shopping before the show, and she threw something. I wonder what it was. I didn't know what it was like. And all of a sudden, it hit me on the back of the head and fell down at the floor. And it was like half a pound of corned beef. All over the floor was that all? Lumps of corned beef all over the floor. I think an old man was, wasn't annoyed. He was probably his tea, like, you know. I was at Elder Stadium in Edinburgh with um, 
with Cr Crabtree, Max Crabtree, and he was the promoter. And he used to he used to be part of Railway School Promotions. He used to promote in Scotland. And we're in Leith Stadium, and I'm on with Andy Robbins. Andy Robbins was the lumberjack, the guy that had the bear. And Scotland loved him. He drove a Ferrari. He was a real flash character, and they absolutely loved him. And I was on with him, and I was being portrayed as a bad guy down there for years, and I was there. And Leith Stadium is like the, it's like a pit. All the seating comes down. All concrete steps going down. The rings in the middle. Steps. Now, if you're up the steps and all stood on the steps, it's impossible to get back to the dressing room. I've seen it happen a few times, you know. So I said to Max, well, how are you going to get me out? So I get the boys ready, because the boys, in the, if, it, if it goes off and the crowd get you, the wrestlers come out and help you get back in, if you're a bad guy, you know. So I said, oh, this is going to be great. Max said, don't worry. He said, don't worry. He said, I'll open this door. He said, instead of going there, you go there. You go through this door, you come out of the gents' toilets, <laughs> round the back, you're in the dressing room. I said, great, great. So... Andy Robbins is lay on the floor covered in blood. The crowd are going bananas, and Andy Robbins says, Get the bastard. You know? <laughs> and they go after me. And I run for the door. I get the door's locked. <laughs> you know? Crabtree, typical promoter, lock the door. People are all around me. Now, Max would have loved it in the papers. You know, a wrestler, a tough guy wrestler gets abused by the crowd, you know, but he, I couldn't get through the door. And I ran, and I ended up in this room. I didn't know where I was going. I just ran and got in this thing, and all these hundreds of people behind me. And I get in this thing, and it's a big cellar with a load of coal piled up on the thing. And I went in there, and they all come in the door. So they didn't come in. I picked a shovel up, you know, and I thought, the first one is going to get in. And they didn't come in, but they got the coal, and they were throwing the coal at me. And I had the, I had the shovel, and they were stopping the, the coal with the shovel, I was going bang, bong, <laughs> bing, bang, you know, and they were throwing hundreds of bits of coal at me, and I was for about ten minutes before the police came and rescued me, and I went back and I said to him, Crabtree, who locked the door? And he said, remote lock, son. Remote <laughs> lock, you know. What's your favourite? I got into trouble for using it. It was called the Kamikaze Crash because it was Negasaki's <laughs> move. And, and I did a TV show and I finished the match with this Kamikaze Crash. What is it? What is it? Where you have the guy across your back and you run and dive, sort of land on his stomach and off you go. Um, but the next time I bumped into Negas at one of the shows, he gave me a right over it. That's my move, Bang. You shouldn't be using it. So I used it once. That's <laughs> on the TV. But I, I got. About Nagasaki in the mask. Yeah, well, bad. tough guy, you know, Nagasaki. Yeah, real very, tough very guy. Very tough guy. Yeah. His, his career, his career. When he was 16, he was heavyweight box, uh, heavyweight weightlifting champion of England. Mm. He comes from a wealthy family. They sent him to Japan, where he, he earned he learned judo and a couple of other. Uh, Kendo. Yeah, you look Kendo as well, and he's wrestled at a high level all over the world since. In um, Japan as well, didn't he? Because he was in Japan, he, yeah. but he was a very well thought of in Japan. He's a yeah, legend in very Japan. Much so, I remember yeah. interviewing him. He wouldn't take his. Yeah. He, lived the, he lived the persona that was. He yeah. lived the persona. Exactly. He did it right. He did it right. He come to the dressing rooms. He'd never take the mask off. And let me off. tell you, well, he came off, didn't it, in defeat somewhere? Yeah, I took it off him. Well, you yeah, took yeah, it off. Yeah. I took it off him. Yeah. What happened? I had a big series with him. I mean, I was very much in trouble for that. You know, if you watch uh, YouTube, when you, when you go into YouTube, there's a little short film, and it's about me not giving him his mask back. <laughs> it's a bit of a comedy film that they've made it. It's quite good. Yeah. Somebody plays me from the office, one of the guys from the office, plays me on that. And uh, I end up with his mask, and I won't give it back. Big Daddy, who's somebody playing Big Daddy, saying, give him the mask back. And I said, no, no, he knows where it is. I'll get it. But we had a big <laughs> deal with that. I pulled it off, and it was, I was very much in trouble for that. Because I was, you know, I tried to destroy the legend, and really, he's, he's got a lot of life left in him. And um, he does have a feud for about two years, and it was an amazing thing that we went around all the arenas with, and it filled, it sold out everywhere. He's a tough guy. He's hurt me lots, really hurt me. Broke my ribs, dislocated, broke my sternum. He's he's a very tough guy. But if my memory serves me right, when you took the mask off. He ran out the ring like double quick. He ran quick, the ring like this. So he quick, didn't see yeah. his face. So quick. So and no one his, ever. His no one ever spotted him, him like you know. The first, the first time I ever seen him without his mask on, um, Brian Glover had written a wrestling and he'd give me a part in it. It was called Sending the Girls and Haystacks and Naggers were the top billers, and uh, it off at the end of the scene. That was the first time I'd seen him. And no, I'd, I've never seen that. Much. I'd worked with him for years. It was, it, it was just a very quick glimpse. Mm -hmm. Again. What did you see? What, what did he look like? 
He had so, well, funny he did, eyes, he funny eyes. He did it eventually, he did it on the TV. Yeah, on he He's got a big eye eyes. on the top of his head. Uh, and he has red contact lenses. Yeah. And he's a very... But he lives the style. He lives what he is. He's not a fake. He is... He lives the life. He lives that... He lives the Nagasaki life. What was your favourite move in the ring? Well, my move, every time I got a move that was a hot move, everybody copied it. So I had to keep changing my move. <laughs> I remember going to Japan, I did a suplex off the top rope, and the next day, they had it in the paper and the magazines of how to do it. <laughs> to showing people how I did it. Yeah. Oh. I, I body slammed someone onto the front, slammed them onto the corner post, climbed up after them, stood on the top rope, in the air, and threw myself backwards with them. And it was spectacular. It was shown in slow motion, backwards and forwards. And then the next day they were saying, this is how you do it. <laughs> you know, well, there must yeah, be one yeah. favourite one you have. Well, always the pile driver. It was always my finish with the yeah. pile driver. And I've pile driving everybody on the concrete. And how did, <laughs> how did that go, the pile driver? Just the pile driver, you turn them upside turn down, upside so down. you've got the leg between your, yeah. uh, the head between your legs, you grip them around the waist, and you, 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 fall you, you, you fall down. And lots of people have hurt with that. And they get their head, you know, on, on, the, uh, the, bang, on the, ring. the ring. On the ring. Yours? My, uh, very simple, really, because I'm a, I'm a left-hander, you see, and, and a few forearm smashes, which, which it was always good because people who expect mm. you to be right-handed, mm. they don't expect like a left. No. So we just soften them up left hand and a body slam. But mix, mix, very simple. Simple. mix, short, mix jab. a short jab, short jab. more of a jab. Yeah. Yeah. Wrestling, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But Mick's elbow was harder than his fist. Yeah. And when I was a kid growing up, he gave me a little bang on the corner yeah. and it hit me with my nervy and I couldn't yeah. see straight for about three or four so, minutes. So uh, like that, that was fairly simple, really. A few short arm jabs, a couple of elbows and body slam and that was it, you know. Nothing, nothing fancy. Brute, brute nothing fancy, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> with, the, with the great memories, what would it be or the people that you would remember most when you look back to that glorious period of wrestling? What do you think about? What do you mean? What, what the wrestling characters? People characters, or? the atmosphere, the whole lot. Let, let's you... go through the north and well, south. Well, uh, my, my, my favourite, and he was a very dear friend of mine, he actually died in the ring with Big Daddy, was Malka Muki, as we call him. Yeah, great, great he, star. I was in Africa with him, and I got dysentery out there. And he was just like me dad, you know, and like Tony Sinclair, we were all out in Africa. And he looked at a myriad of stars at that time. Yeah. All the lightweights, you know. I, um, yeah. I mean, you, you were chief of the light yeah. of the... I was like Mike Marino. But Mike Marino well, was a legend. Mike Marino was a fantastic was say, and a diplomat. He was one of my... Uh, Favourites. I, I had two fellas, really. And uh, Mike Marino and Steve Logan. Steve Logan fantastic. lived quite near to me, and we had a lot in common. We knew... Like from part, school days, yeah, we knew, yeah. we knew, you know, we knew people from school day. But Mike Marino was, I didn't know Mike because he, which was, wasn't, you know, was in London, but it wasn't, wasn't sort of just around the corner. But Mike was one of those fellows who would be, he was travelling with. You never had a bad, you never had any bad, no. you, anything happened bad when, when he was travelling with Mike. Fellas to travel with, he and we used to do the whole trip. an awful lot of travelling in those days. Mm. Obviously, you know. But, but the star Steve Vida was a great star. <coughs> he, was, yeah. he, was a, he was fantastic. I always, Mike, I always remember Mike. Funny enough, we were travelling up to up to Leeds from London to Leeds. Jack Dempsey was in the yeah. uh, with us, and we got in the compartment, and uh, it was a, a no smoking compartment. But at this time, Jack Dempsey was a pipe. This period. You should, you should smoke a bloody pipe morning, noon, and I think, I think if, he, if he could smoke a pipe and wrestle, he would have done, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> cut a long story short, out come the pipe light, and he's, he's puffing away, and, uh, and uh, then all of a sudden, from the distance, I heard, um, tickets, please. So all of a sudden, like, um, Mike's dozing. And Jack had the pipe, so he put the pipe down next to Mike, <laughs> on, on his seat, like, you know, next to him. So the fella come in the door, a ticket, sorry sir, he said, uh, you have to put the pipe out, he said, this is no smoking, you that, don't you? So Mike said, well, thank you very much, I'm terribly sorry, he said, I've been wanting to get rid of this disgusting habit for years. He opened the bloody window and threw the pipe out the window. What? Yeah, the fantastic sense of humour. Jack wasn't too pleased, like, hey, bloody hell, like, it was my best pipe. But one thing that wrestling has produced, some of the most wonderful storytellers, 
hand. Isn't it? <laughs> no. You know, you could get in a car and go in up to door knocker somewhere in Scotland yeah, where we all used to dread or yeah. Great Yarmouth. <laughs> you heard. Can you think about that? Can you come up yeah, with I've, one well, favourite one? Two favourite. The lads like to use the laxatives on the way to the venues. Um, and the younger boys like Dynamite and David, they, the, the, when we go to Scotland... We, one. That was me going to Africa, that one. We, we used to hide them in the boot of the car and say, and they forgot their passport to go into Scotland. And uh, then we'd, <laughs> ride, we'd wind the guy up on the bridge to search the car and find them. <laughs> Haystacks hey, went, to, went to France with me. Two of us went to France. And he got stuck in the toilets. Oh, yeah. he, he, he like a lobster trap. It's like goes in, it, the door goes in this way and he goes in. Yeah, yeah. Locks. He, can't, he couldn't get the door open enough to get back out again. And they had to land with him in the thing. And he made all the press. But bear in mind, Gary, he was 40 11. So he's really he was 40 wood stone. 40, uh, massive. So yeah. it was in all the papers. So he was very embarrassed about it being in the papers. The following Tuesday, we all go to Africa. There's about 10 of us go to Africa. And uh, he's one of them. You know, so me and Tony Sinclair were practical jokers. We got some laxative chewing gum. Put it in Wrigley Piss Beermint chewing gum. So we get going, do you want a chewing gum? Yeah, I have a chewing gum. He said, I said, don't eat anything on this flight because you want to go to the toilet. So just have a chewing gum. So I give him about three of these elective chewing gum. And he said, he said, I need to go to the toilet. So I got the stewardess. I said, um, last week he got in the toilet, he got stuck. He's got a bit of a problem. I said, what are we going to do? He needs to go to the toilet. So they said, oh, no. So they all went up to the front of the galley. They can see the curtains open. And they get this big book out, like a big library book. And, he, and they're looking through the thing. And it must have been... Big fat man needs to go to the toilet, can't fit in the toilet. So they look at it about five minutes, right, for this book. And then they go, the light goes on, and they go, we've got it, we've got it. So I said, what? So I sat next to him, and he's saying, oh, you know, he's dead embarrassed. What's going to happen? I said, they're going to take the galley curtain off, they're going to go to the back of the plane, they're going to hold the galley curtain up, you're going to go behind, and they're going to give you a plastic bag. You're going to go in the plastic bag. And he went, I can't believe that. I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do this. I can't do this. So, <laughs> we, he, get, he has to do it. We, they got to go, got to go. They get the galley curtains the back of the plane. They hold the curtains up like this. I am now, I've got pains with trying to hold back the laughing. You know, I was really, really laughing. So they go back. The girl comes with a pair of rubber gloves on and a black bin bag. And she walks right the way down the plane. Didn't secret it at all. Didn't. She went behind the thing. She handed it behind the curtain. He's behind the curtain. So I had to make much of it. So I started, oh, oh no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's behind the curtain, you know. <laughs> and I'm doing the whoop, whoop, just at the back, you know, and they're all looking around like this, you know. And there's giant haystacks behind the curtain, you know. And um, and eventually he passes the bag out, and the girl with the rubber gloves gets the bag, and she walks again right to the front of the plane with this thing, takes it back and locks it away somewhere, and then they come with an air freshener, right. So he comes from behind the curtain, he's like, oh, oh you know. Oh, I had a terrible stomach hit. So he gets sat down again, and I said to him, do you, do you want another chew? Have a chewing gum, but fresh in your mouth. And we had him behind the curtain three times in the 10 hour flight. <laughs>Political, I think, <laughs> really. Big Daddy was top of the bill, and he had the call. Like, when I was top of the bill, I had the call who I wanted to wrestle with. And he, wa he wanted to wrestle him because he had a good show, the crowd went home happy, and um, because of that situation, he was like a journeyman in boxing. He Great. went in there, he tried his best. He's not going to beat Big Daddy. Big Daddy, surprisingly, I know a lot about, it, about Big Daddy, because I ended up with travelling with him a lot. And I used to, tr when I was in London uh, a lot of the time, I used to train with him, and he actually used to go to Crystal Palace nearly every day. Yeah, he did. And he ran round the track in Crystal Palace, and he amazed me. Yeah. He amazed me. Mm. Now he had uh, an incident with Jeff Capes. The there, big didn't shot putter, Jeff Capes, the big fella. He's got a, he's a, a funny sort of a character. He's a very character, and he was on the track already, and he said, "Ah, Big Daddy, I've always wanted to wrestle you." And Big Daddy was minding his own business, and he went and grabbed him. And, I, and Big Daddy picked him up like he was a baby, and just threw him to one, to one side. I'm not joking. I was absolutely. He was a strong man. Very strong man. Jeff was in tears afterwards. He was very <laughs> embarrassed and very upset about it. But Big Daddy treated him like he was a little lad. He just pushed him out of the way. But you've got to remember, Mark. I remember Big Daddy. Well, I didn't remember him, but uh, knew of him when he was um, when he was about 14, 15 stone. Beach at um, Blackpool. At Blackpool was as a lifeguard. 
and he was in terrific shape. He was a bodybuilder. He, he was, was a bodybuilder. Body he, 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 he was in ter he was in terrific shape. I've and seen him as a picture of him, he had, he, like a muslim man. And because he had to be like a, a pretty useful, because he was. If God, anyone yeah. got any trouble, he had to pull them out, and uh, and it was a big transformation, you know. When when not not next I saw him, but over the years, how he came from this magnificent-looking specimen to uh, it wasn't it didn't look ugly or anything like that. He lost his shape and he got. But so he did it on purpose. Heavy, you know. He did he, it on purpose. Yeah. He did it on purpose. We both know. Yeah. I used to see him drinking pints of full cream, double cream, and I said, "What are you doing?" Yeah. And he said, it's good for your system, it's good to keep you lubricating your yeah. system. I used to eat, he used to eat, um, not massively, but he used to eat things that would make him gain weight. Big Daddy, he, he was a wrestler, then sort of disappeared, then came back, and suddenly you got giant haystacks. That changed wrestling from all the yeah. moves that yeah. you did. Yeah. You suddenly got these big guys. I mean, it wasn't for the best as well. It wasn't for it the wasn't, best. No, I agree. So, it was a family so, operation. So tell us, I left tell us about that. I left then. Yeah, when, when that became what, the top of when, the bill. When I first started working for Dale Martins um, in the early 70s, um, my first TV match was in 74, and that was for Morell and Beresford. Um, I was working with guys like Tibor Zakash, Tuggy Alton, um, Steve Agatti. I was working with guys that were teaching me how to wrestle, basically. With Daddy, it was more of a circus without being rooted. What he did for wrestling, he put it back on top, and it, it, we got millions of viewers. Um, but I, and it, it, it's not jealousy. I think I don't think it was good for the business. It was good for me because I suited him. So I come from a nobody really, or a bottom of the card wrestler, mm. to a top of the bill wrestler. You, yeah, of because I was on top of the bill every night. My name was in big letters with Daddy because our match was the top match. Uh, as Mark said, when him and Marty Jones and yeah, me, 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 uh, battles. Uh, yeah. Um, so what happened with tag wrestling? You suddenly became giant Well, tag Asics. wrestling was a big thing. In, in the early days, yeah, well, you know, it was it was very, very good. Good. when tag matches started, very good, the, we yeah. never seen it. And there were the Royal Brothers, the Black Knights, the, yeah. the, the Jet Set. And the yeah. Jet Set, there loads and loads of people. The loads Borgs. Of, loads of the Borg Twins. Loads and loads of great tag teams. Yeah. And they were spectacular. They were really spectacular. I've got to say this to you as well, that the TV show in the UK, in England, um, was in America at the same time as we were having the Saturday afternoon shows. Sometimes you had it on Saturday and Wednesday, I remember. the TV. It was very popular here in England. The, the Americans used to look at our TV shows as their icon. TV shows were different, completely different. I was in, I've been to America dozens, hundreds of times. But in America, they used to have regional shows. Um, they'd be in Los Angeles or somewhere, and they had a regional TV. You know what I mean? They had a different. It wasn't. It wasn't national TV. So they used to the promo for the wrestling show in the afternoon of the of the show. So they get a couple of the top of the bill boys that go down. They'd have a they'd have a ring somewhere in a school playground or somewhere. They'd have all the kids watching it, and they get the guys in, and they do the promo in the in the ring. You know, I'm going to get you later, seven o'clock tonight at the at the. Do our stadium. I'm going to fight you and break your leg and all that stuff, and it was like very cheesy. But so the American wrestling, um, they looked up to the British wrestlers. Absolutely. We sent him over there. Well, he went over there. Um, lad uh, Bill Robinson from yeah, Manchester, Robinson, uh, one of Manchester. the best wrestlers you'll ever see in your life. Very athletic. Real, you know, he could break anyone's leg in ten seconds. He he amazing. basically took America by storm when he went over there, and consequently. The guys from England, like Got a great British Bulldog, Dynamite, Me. Chrissy Adams, well they all went over there and they looked up to him. So what do you think now with the giant haystacks, Big Daddy taking it all over, what are your thoughts? In the I'm too keen on it because obviously I was, among, like, I was like with Mark, you know, I was a bit of a mover and, and, uh, and uh, I didn't like to see too many like, uh, fellas which were, I don't know, not, not too much movement because yeah. I think the wrestling is all about movement. And, uh, it, it was in, it was a novelty. It wore itself very thin, fairly yeah. quickly. I was at top of the bill. There was three or four top of the bills at the time. This is after mixed run, really. It was yeah. it was after you. Yeah. It was. Um, me, Daddy and Haystacks were, were there, but there was four four maybe big draws in the country, and they could fill all. 
But I was getting pushed together with Daddy, which I didn't like. I got a contract in Japan, which was amazing money. Uh, I was doing a lot in the States. I was in Madison Square Gardens quite a lot um, for Vince Senior and Vince Junior. I'd met up with Hogan and those guys. From, they, were, they were very much wanting me to go and work in America with them. And um, I broke loose from uh, joint promotions. There was a couple of small promoters. And I went with them, all-star Brian, Brian Dixon, Oreg Williams, who sadly just died, who were very go-ahead young people. And they got all the new talents and a lot of movement. And we were, we were doing the same type of shows that Del Marcy was, days, yeah. was yeah, doing before, days. Daddy. Yeah. So I was very happy with that. So yeah. I spent a lot of time abroad, and I was coming back to you and doing two or three weeks here and then going back for four or five weeks over there. And that was how it worked. Um, and that was progressive. That was going forward. Unfortunately, this is when Greg Dyke pulled the, pulled the plug on the whole job, when me and Mick had already been in negotiations with B Sky B, if you remember. Brian Dixon, me and you, yeah, had, yeah, yeah. had had a couple of meetings with B Sky B. About, is it that right, B Sky B? Yeah, it was a forerunner <laughs> to Sky Tell. That's right. Yeah. Well, that, they were wanting to carry on to do it in a different format after Greg had pulled the plug on it. And that, that was the future. And when that didn't happen, um, I'd still got my big contract in, in Japan. And the thing with Crabtree was oh, running the show and, and making money for the promoters and making money for themselves. But um, I wanted to do the Japan thing, and it was a bit of an ultimatum with me. Well, you've got to be here at the top of the bill, or you've got to be there. And I went there and did my own thing. But there were one or two people not doing the sport too much good at the time, including you, Tony. You did a big, massive story in the sun. What prompted you to do that? Well, it was a bad time in my life, really. Um, I'd just lost my sister, 22 years old, in a car accident. And I lived for wrestling. You know, I was doing seven nights a week wrestling. You know, I was. And my sister had died. I was at a very low ebb. Uh, and I had no phone calls from any wrestlers. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about your sister or anything like that. The first call I got was from the promoter, Max Crab, to the ear kid. He said, when are you coming back to work? He said, Daddy's coming back to you. And that just made the decision for me, you know, and I regret now I've spent 30 years putting that right, you know, I'm now, you know, a lot of the lads didn't te speak to me for a long time over it. But what I did had been done many, many times before me. Don Branch had did it. Uh, Brian Maxine's brother had put a microphone in the dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, it had all been done. Paolo slagged it off in his book, You Grunt, I Groan. Um, let, me see, let me put a stop to this because I don't like this talk. No, but, uh, but I'll tell you know, what, I'll tell you We why. need to know, Mark. Okay, yeah, you need to know what he said. We, we need okay. to know what he said. Then okay, I'll but I'll tell you some other stories when you yeah. finish. All right, now, what were you doing to the sport? What did you say? Basically, I didn't attack the wrestling. No, but what, I attacked what, the what was the point of the story? To get back to the crab trees. To get at the crab trees. Because yeah, I, what I, did you say? What did you say in these articles? Tell everybody. Well, basically, I said how I had to lose every night to Big Daddy. Uh, you know, um, and when the story went to the sun, I physically challenged him, and it was all set up that he was going to wrestle me or fight for real at uh, Crystal Palace. And David Hamilton, my friend who was the DJ, he was going to be my second, and Daddy was going to have one of his brothers as his second. Uh, and I remember Piers Morgan was at the Sun at the time, along with um, David Clift, I think it was, that wrote the article. Uh, and he said to the Crabtrees, right, Tony Walsh has said, he'll defend what he said, and he'll meet with you and have a square go. The exact words that come from was, nobody's making a monkey out of me, and slammed the phone down on the Sun newspaper. So, you know, but as I as Mark's right, you know, it's something I don't want to dwell on because it's something that's gone, it's 30 years old. Um, this is easy to knock wrestling. It's very easy, very, it's very transparent wrestling. But when you get slammed on the concrete and you break two bones in your back, it's real. Mick, I just want to finish with a bit of nostalgia about those, those <laughs> really big names. I mean, Brian Glover. Fantastic. Uh, Leon Harris yeah. was his wrestling name. I mean, brilliant. actor now. A brilliant and, and, star, yeah. though. And, and yeah. uh, um, those are the guys Pat that Roach. really... Look at Pat, Pat Roach. Roach. Was yeah. a legend. Yeah. Oh. You know? Yes. We had some wonderful characters. You're right. All, all those was characters the time were all sort of things. Zoltan Boschek, fantastic little, uh, little lightweight wrestler. Yeah. Very yeah. Big character, big person in the ring. Tibor Zakas, the nicest man in the world. He, Gee, was a, yeah. he was a silver medalist in the Olympics. Terrific, yeah, terrific. A fantastic wrestler, brilliant yeah, wrestler, yeah. a very kind man, knowledgeable, would he always help you, you know. And then the characters like... like Cat the, Weasel. The, Cat, now, Cat say, Weasel tickled you.
He did. He's and and, and <laughs> there, were, there were submissions, you know, McManus tickled yeah. to defeat. No, he wasn't, wasn't tickled really. He, um, <laughs> he had the ability to sort out um, little and your, and your body have all got vital points. You know, he could do body. it. He could, and he could do he that could do with it. his feet, you know. He could do it. And, with his uh, feet? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, of course, he, um, it, uh, <laughs> he got to one or two sore, not sore points, but ones that, you know, that give you a little bit of a jip like, <laughs> and, 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 and that was it. And his cremation, he played Great Balls of Fire. That okay. was his, that yeah. was his He was idea. an Elvis fan. But, yeah. you know, they really the great days of my life. You know, I don't regret a day. Nobody forced me to do, to do the wrestling. And it made me stand out. You know, and but I'm as a kid, as kid, children, what, not kids, but young kids, young young people, young watching the wrestling show, looked up to people, and they all had like now they've got different, they've got different icons, but they had icons. They, they, we had followings, didn't we, of people, yeah. lovers or haters, oh, yeah. and all those all those characters were created, partly by luck, and partly by endeavour. A lot of the people created the characters that came about because of how they were and how they wrestled, not because they planned it. These were the highlight days of your life. You, you must look back and think, it was fantastic. Amazing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You I don't appreciate it until you look back. No at all, I think. I'm, uh, you know, I chose a profession which has been good for me and uh, suited me, and, uh, and, and like I said, it's marvellous. I wouldn't have... I, I wouldn't have liked to have been a doctor or a dentist or anything like that, or a bloody financier, or a bank clerk, or something like that. That was my business, wrestling. I, f I found my... That was my forte. Yeah. Tony, he thank you very much indeed for sharing these memories. It was, it, it was wonderful. It's been fantastic. As a, I've, I've been in all of these two since I started wrestling, you know. Um, and I was very privileged, of course. We've become friends over the years, you know. And uh, if I had one regret in my life, I wish I hadn't spoke to the newspaper. Um, but that's water, really, that's water it's under gone, the bridge. It's yeah, gone. Water it's all healed up now. Tony, thank you very much. Mark Rollerball. Rocco, thank yeah, you. It's a pleasure to meet great you. Great names. And, uh, great. Yeah. Thank Good you. to see you. And Mick McManus, the doyen of the wrestlers. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Lovely to have you. Thank you, Barry. We've nice just got one bit of have a good week till next week. <laughs> <laughs> that was Kent's old saying. Yeah. Yeah. Wrestling fans, have a good week. Thank you, gentlemen. Great.